Okay, um, let's, uh, let's get started. Welcome everyone to this online seminar in individual innovation in digitally enabled trials in a decidedly cold Edinburgh this morning. Uh, my name is John Norring. I'm going to chair today's uh, session. Um, just by way of background, um, <clears throat> Edinburgh University is developing several data repositories, <clears throat> such as the Data Lock, um, which joins primary and secondary and social care data and also uh, the HDR Breathe Hub, uh, which is for respiratory data sets. And here in Edinburgh, we're very keen to um, build a community of interest around um, using these resources, particularly um, exploiting them through digitally enabled trials. And we thought it would be a good thing to start today with this, uh, this get this going with this online seminar. Um, the purpose is to, to look, looking to bring together a range of views from both academia, industry, and also beyond um, to discuss various experiences and challenges and opportunities to take this discipline forward. Um, the, the seminar should last around about 90 minutes. Um, we've, we've got six excellent speakers and they'll each be talking for a very time constrained 10 minutes. Um, and then there'll be a, a short discussion session at the end with questions from you, the audience. Now, these questions can be submitted through the Q&A function on the Zoom um, technology. And you can submit these throughout the, uh, the, the, the talks. And then we'll select several at the end of the discussion um, and, and obviously go through those. Also, please note that the session is being recorded and in due course will be available on YouTube. So um, I think uh, I'll now introduce our first um, speaker. Um, this is uh, Professor Aziz Sheikh, who is the director of the Usher Institute and Dean of Data here at the University of Edinburgh. And he's gonna be talking about digitally enabled trials, challenges and opportunities. Aziz has worked, for, worked with numerous governments, the World Health Organization and World Bank, for example, on projects to transform the delivery of healthcare and improve population health using health IT and data science. He leads Breathe, the health data research hub for respiratory health, and is a member of the Scottish government's COVID-19 Chief Medical Officers Advisory Group and the UKRI COVID-19 College of Experts. So over to you, Aziz. I, I think you're on mute, Aziz. Okay. Um, thanks very much indeed, John. Uh, sorry, I got that wrong. Um, thanks everybody for joining. Really looking forward to be part of this and um, sharing some thoughts around digitally enabled trials. Uh, so Anna, could I get the next slide, please? Um, so what I want to do um, today is um, really provide a bit of context, and I hope I mean, other colleagues who are speaking will be able to build on this. But there are a number of concerns with trials as they stand at the moment. Um, many of our trials in the UK, I mean, are, are delayed. Um, the whole process is relatively um, inefficient. So I mean, there, there are concerns around that. Um, as a result of that, um, costs uh, tend to be uh, tend to mount. Um, and there are concerns as to how, I mean, how competitive we are compared with other countries. Uh, a considerable burden on researchers, uh, healthcare professionals, and, and particularly patients and carers associated with uh, data collection and all sorts of trials procedures. A lot of our trials, as a result of I mean, a lot, I mean the above considerations, uh, tend to be short-term follow-up. What we know for clinical purposes is ideally we want a uh, much longer-term follow-up if we're going to make uh, important decisions about people's lives. Uh, and there are also concerns around uh, issues to do with the generalizability or external validity of trials findings. And um, this is an enormous um, issue currently with the UK government, policymakers, uh, scientific leadership, um, because there are concerns that we've lost a substantial portion of our, uh, I mean, our share of the global trials marketplace. 
and whether we can uh, actually cling on to what we've got uh, or even better uh, grow that, that would be fantastic. Uh, so there are a number of drivers for us to think about things differently. Um, so Anna, the next slide, please. Um, but uh, doing things differently I mean, is challenging and um, I mean, part of what's delayed is uh, some of these challenges that I've listed here. I think some of these we're beginning to overcome, uh, but uh, paper-based record systems uh, still persist in the NHS. Uh, um, certainly in social care, they persist uh, very widely. Um, there's been issues, I mean, although we've all moved to smartphones and uh, um, but, but relatively few apps have scaled. I mean, as we're seeing with sort of, I mean, apps currently being discussed in the COVID context, uh, their passage is, is not that straightforward. Concerns around usability, uh, et cetera. Although, I mean, I think things are improving in that respect. Um, I think in the, in the academic uh, context, we see that there are relatively few investigators who really understand the electronic health record landscape uh, across the UK. So which uh, data sets potentially can be used uh, for which context, what are the kind of limitations of these various data sets, et cetera. So that, that kind of overview um, is still, I mean, in relatively few hands in the UK. And there are ongoing concerns, um, particularly with the MHRA, about regulatory issues for, uh, for, for, for CTIMPs, uh, uh, particularly when using electronic health records to uh, adjudicate outcomes. Um, so, um, I mean, I think things are changing. So what we now have is really a, a primary care infrastructure, and that is the main gatekeeper for us, for those joining internationally, is it, where 90% of healthcare interactions take place. That is completely digitized now and has been really for the last uh, two decades. So a real infrastructure available there. Um, there is um, a substantial um, policy, policy push to, to get uh, the hospital sector up to speed uh, by digitizing this. So this began with the National Program Priority, but more recently with the Global Digital Exemplar Program uh, for England and then parallel initiatives in other parts of the UK. Um, there is a lot of interest around actually generating data that are usable, that are well curated, uh, that can be repeatedly reused. And Health Data Research UK is the newest uh, national institute to be launched, uh, which has got this as a particular uh, remit. And I mean, as a result of all of this, I mean, I think there are particular opportunities. And, and what I'll try and do is illustrate some of these in the examples I share around feasibility assessment for trials. Uh, really um, making the process of recruitment much more efficient than it uh, currently is, point of care randomization, uh, linking data to allow long-term uh, outcome assessment, and then also trying to I mean, address issues to do with uh, uh, contextualization of findings, so that's whether it's process-related re uh, evaluations or to do with external validity assessments. Okay, um, the next slide, please. So what I want to do is share briefly... Um, um, three uh, examples. Uh, so the first is the PINSA trial, and then I'll move on to PADOSA, and the last one is the Elvis COVID-19 trial, which we're just beginning. So um, click through again, Anna, please, for the next slide. So the PINSA trial was a trial we did a few years ago. I mean, as ever, these are partnerships uh, involving several universities, but this was a large cluster randomized controlled trial. And what we were interested in was trying to reduce the um, prevalence of um, really important prescribing errors. And so it was IT-enabled pharmacists being brought into the mix, so a skill mix intervention, uh, to try and reduce these clinically important errors in, in primary care context. Um, so, um, Anna, the next slide, please. Um, and, and just um, click right through to the end of this slide, please. That would be great. So what we had was uh, we interrogated um, the primary care records to identify um, I mean, 10 classes of prescribing errors um, that uh, were identified by clinicians agreed on as being sort of potentially um, really important clinically. And uh, in this cluster randomized controlled trial, uh, to one arm, uh, we gave um, them indications. We, we, we provided feedback as to the errors, uh, which patients they occurred in. So we call that the simple feedback arm. And then the other arm, uh, we introduced a pharmacist to try and uh, deal with those errors and deal with the underlying um, systems. Um, so this was done at scale. It was done on uh, 72 in 72 practices 
involving half a million patients. And the only reason we were able to do it at that scale was that, I mean, this was nearly all done using the underpinning electronic health record system. Um, so, Anna, the next uh, slide, please. Um, and so these are the kind of headline findings. The main outcomes were at six months. And what we found was for the three primary outcome measures, and normally we only sort of talk about having one here, we had three. Um, and again, this is doable because of the electronic health record infrastructure. What we found was uh, sub substantial uh, reductions um, um, from the pharmacist-led uh, intervention. Okay, uh, Anna, the next uh, slide, please. And then we, what we're also do, interested in was looking at longer-term outcomes because I mean, it's the longer-term outcomes that really matter to, to clinicians, to patients, uh, carers. And what we can see is um, still a signal for two of those outcomes, but a degree of uh, attenuation of that signal. And now that's had bearings on how we begin to think about the rolling out of this. Um, so, Anna, the next uh, slide, please. Um, so the trial is there, and I won't go into any more details um, I mean, around this, so you can have a read about it uh, in the Lancet. Um, but what, what, what we've got here is we have, I mean, in the placebo or control arm, we had simple feedback, so there is still an intervention going on. So what we were able to do was take 500 other practices um, and measure those same um, baseline measures and outcome measures at six months and 12 months for those same indicators uh, to see what was happening in relation to secular trends. So that's the green bar there. And so this is an example of how you can begin to contextualize findings. So using a comprehensive cohort design with an embedded uh, cluster randomized controlled trial. And it's this trial innovation that we can begin to do. So I mean, really, we're only bounded by our own creativity there. So I know the next uh, slide, please. Um, so this was assessed, and click through again, um, please. Um, um, so this was assessed by NICE. It was, I mean, of course, uh, a formal health economic evaluation that went with this, a longitudinal qualitative evaluation. So this has been, uh, now is being rolled out. And under the next slide, please. Um, and what we're now doing is this has been rolled out to 50% of practices across England. So we're covering around 30 million lives. And what we're able to do is continue to track what's happening uh, to these outcome measures uh, post rollout. And what we're beginning to see uh, here uh, with routine implementation, so we're moving into this hybrid effectiveness implementation uh, kind of uh, design phase. And as a result of these run charts, what we're beginning to see is a signal that is even more substantial than we saw in the clinical trial. Um, so Anna, the next slide, please. Uh, so that's an example of a trial that's really scaled. Um, it's one of I mean, but, but without that, that kind of health informatics infrastructure uh, using uh, data intelligently, I mean, that would never have happened. Um, okay, um, so uh, this is a, a trial of a lifestyle intervention to try and reduce the um, incidence of new onset diabetes in, in South Asian patients, uh, so the PEDOSA trial. What we ran into with this trial was some problems. Uh, we uh, were aiming to recruit 600 people um, unfortunately, we only got around 170. Um, and so it's a tr problem that many trialists face. As a result of that, what we did is we shifted the primary outcome measure to weight loss. And we did that completely explicitly. I mean, made that clear to the oversight committee, the funding agency, et cetera. And as you can see, weight loss uh, was reduced in this trial. Um, uh, click again, please, Anna. Um, and uh, click. But in terms of, I mean, the, our original primary outcome measure, sorry, go back a slide, please. In terms of our original primary outcome measure, uh, which was around prevention of diabetes, um, there was a potential signal there, but as you can see from the confidence intervals, um, we're massively underpowered, so there's a lot of imprecision, uh, I, I mean, around that point estimate. So click uh, through again, please. And so, I mean, it's, it's kind of, a, I mean, so a substantial sum of money spent on this trial, problems uh, that are not dissimilar from any other. So but what we then did is we linked uh, those trial data with the SkyDC database. So using the unique identifier available in Scotland, this is an electronic health record curated database of diabetes. And what we were able to link and study then outcomes seven years post-randomization, the trial was only for three years. So what we're doing is, is kind of capitalizing on that trials infrastructure, on that health informatics infrastructure. So click through again. 
uh, please, uh, Anna. Uh, and we've just reported this. So what we're able to do is uh, confirm that um, really um, this intervention unfortunately didn't uh, work in terms of improving uh, uh, or preventing the onset of diabetes. Yes, we can achieve weight loss, but uh, we're unable to prevent uh, diabetes. Uh, next slide, please. And then the last uh, example I've got uh, is a trial that we're just beginning. So this is completely web-based Bayesian randomization trial uh, around uh, um, using, uh, trying to investigate um, a saltwater uh, solution to try and uh, halt progression of COVID-19. So this is completely using an electronic health info record infrastructure uh, to enable this trial. Uh, and so the last uh, slide, please, uh, Anna. And, and so in summary, a really considerable interest in trying to do, do things differently. I think our digitized health infrastructure is beginning to enable this. And uh, there's a lot of expertise developing in Edinburgh, and you're going to hear about some of this later on, but some links uh, available to you, which I think, which I hope will be of some help, uh, really. Um, thanks very much indeed. I'll stop there. Thanks, John. Many, many, many thanks, Aziz. Uh, so um, we are um, under great time pressure today, so we'll move straight into the, bear in mind that the questions will be answered, answered at the end after all the speakers have, have, have spoken. Uh, so we'll move straight into the uh, second talk. Delighted to welcome Dave Leather, who is the Global Medical Vice President of GSK Respiratory Therapy. Um, and he's going to talk about the Salford Lung Study, Hiccups and Hurdles. And Dave is the leader, as I said, of GSK's Global Medical Affairs Team for Inhaled Asthma Medications. He has a leadership role in real-world pragmatic trials. And as I've just said, he's the leader of the internationally recognised Salford Lung Study. So take it away, Dave. Thanks, John. Uh, good morning, everyone. It really is a pleasure uh, to be here. Um, and yeah, I'm going to be telling you about the Salford Lung Study. If I could have the next slide, please. So uh, the Salford Lung Study, um, for those who don't know about it, um, it is pretty unique. It was the first ever prospective phase three pragmatic trial that evaluated the effectiveness of a pre-licensed medicine. Um, and this actually, uh, as far as I know, has not been uh, repeated yet. We've done other similar interventional trials, but the, um, the, the thing, there were some very uh, unusual things about this study. Firstly, it was based in one city in Salford, which is a city just north of Manchester. If you don't know, it's where the home of Manchester United Football Club happens to be, which is not a good thing. I support Liverpool. And we did two studies, one in COPD recruiting more than 4,000 patients and one in asthma uh, recruiting nearly 3,000 patients. So very large studies in one city. Every single GP and every community pharmacy in the town was involved in this study. And on the left-hand side of this slide is a schema, which is very simple, but this is roughly how these two studies ran. Patients were randomised, it was interventional, they either received a study medication or stayed on usual care. Between their baseline assessment and a year later, they really had little uh, contact in terms of formal um, contact with study staff. Uh, all of the key endpoints and signals were picked up using the electronic health record, and our safety monitoring was done using the electronic health record as were our, our um, endpoints in a COPD study, which were exacerbations, looking at causes of steroids and or antibiotics. In the asthma study, we had to telephone the patients three times to administer the asthma control test. So it wasn't quite um, as, as true to normal life. But the aim was to keep thing care absolutely normal between the start and the end. We've also um, attempted to do an extension study, which didn't go well because of uh, difficulty in getting people to re-consent. Um, that, that's a story in itself, which I won't go into today, but we're just about to publish actually the details of that. Next slide. So this is um, an interventional uh, study and uh, a, a really complex collaboration between GPs, hospital, academia, GSK, data providers. And I just thought I'd just go through a few of these. This is a big list and I'm not going to go through every one, but a few of the key things actually that perhaps came as surprises to us or maybe the unexpected. And at the centre, there's this, the book of that'll never work. And that was a bit of a problem with this. And I'll, I'll come back to it. it this, this type of study in the industry is so different that a lot of people really found it difficult to, um, to come to terms with. But the top three uh, hiccups there, how do you find the patients? How do you get the GPs on board and how to recruit all those subjects? Aziz has already talked about difficulties in recruiting in community studies. 
this was very difficult and we had to put a lot of work into community advertising. We had adverts on buses. We really tried to make Salford all about the Salford Lung Study to help us with that. We really had to get, engage with the GPs. We had GP lead champions in each CCG who were just superb, who got the GPs on board. And you know, every single GP in the city did join the study. So that was actually around about 74 GP practices. The other bit about was we were trying not to interfere with normal care, and that's a challenge. And we did look at some data around that and, and tried to estimate what is the impact of doing a trial and how long does that look. Um, we published on that, and that's another story in itself. A lot of time was spelt, spent on really recruiting a support team and developing an operational model that was really efficient um, to drive recruitment. Um, we actually employed 165 people, believe it or not, to, to do this. Dealing with the unexpected was one that I don't think we sort of saw coming, but various things happened along the way, such as uh, an online pharmacy uh, service based in Leeds set up um, delivering uh, medicines to patients in Salford. Obviously, we were supplying study medication, which was with a pre-licensed medicine through the pharmacists in the city. That was something we had to come to terms with. And, and there were a number of issues like that, things that in real studies, these things happen, these things change and things you have to deal with them. The pharmacy involvement story was really nothing short of a miracle. I mean, every single pharmacist in town, there were 132 high street pharmacies in and around Salford that were involved in the study. All of them trained in good clinical practice. We actually trained 1,200 people in GCP, which in itself was a big uh, undertaking. Safety monitoring, and we've actually published about the pharmacy uh, stuff, I'll, and I'll be sharing some of those um, publications with you after this after this meeting, so you can look at them. Um, safety monitoring was pretty unique in this study because we relied on the electronic health record to detect signals that were monitored manually uh, by a safety team. This was really interesting, and again, we've published on this, but at first, this was oversensitive. I was the um, one of the clinical monitors on this study, and we were getting safety signal reports coming through the electronic health record very, very fast. It was really too fast. We had to really dampen that down because we were getting bombarded with signals that often were meaningless. Because obviously in a normal clinical trial, um, usually you're dealing with safety issues retrospectively and things have re resolved. When you're using the EHR in real time, you're seeing things evolve. And that's very different. And one of the really very different things about uh, this type of trial, especially with a, a pre-licensed medicine where safety monitoring is really important. On, over on the right hand side, uh, the data issues, I guess that uh, many of these things will be familiar to many people here who've been involved in these. There, there's always this bit of an over-promise thing with, that, with health records, I think. I'm enthusiastic about it, so are the providers. There's the sense that we can do anything, but actually it's often quite difficult. That's not a problem being uh, enthusiastic, but it's something we have to deal with. The prescribing and dispensing data, I think we had high hopes of that. Uh, Holly Tribble in Aziz's group did a fantastic collaborative bit of work with us looking at the prescription data and the quality of what's written on prescriptions is really sometimes extremely poor. We had to actually resort to eyeballing these sometimes to try and make sense of them for our data collections. So that's one example. Data cleaning, coding and validation, I think is an ongoing thing. The, the electronic record wasn't designed for a drug company research. And obviously coding is variable and inconsistent. We all know those things, we have to deal with it. And then the other stuff, which actually is really important, um, but perhaps doesn't occur front of mind, was the, the fundamental culture clash between the different cultures of the organizations coming together and what they expected. We had to spend a lot of time working at that uh, collaboration. The Hawthorne effect, of course, is a big thing. What happens when you're doing a real world study, but you're advertising about the study on the radio, you've got buses with adverts going on. And we had to set about looking at that. And we did another study called the CHESS study, which we've also published, which you can look into, where we used a parallel cohort of patients elsewhere in Manchester who didn't know they're in a study. That was anonymous data. And we looked at the impact in Salford compared to those patients. And in fact, saw little evidence for Hawthorne effect, but it's a very important consideration. The whole uh, crux of this, that'll never work, I think, sits in the internal and external validity discussion. Industry is driven by internal validity, so are regulators, and I think often payers, but not always these days. But th this is really one of the challenges that I think is never ending, both in, uh, in terms of publishing data like this, where editors maybe uh, uh, view open label studies dimly, 
or, or not really fully understand effectiveness. So, and there is something which we're all taking part in today, which is moving the world forwards in the acceptance of external validity sitting alongside internal validity. But the very fact that regulators generally do not accept open label data is probably one of the reasons why industry isn't moving faster in this space. So next slide. So just to wrap up, I mean, the good news is we did manage to do it. And despite all those issues, and um, it was really the some very fundamental uh, things that we all know about our everyday work. You know, the first thing was single minded focus on the goal. Keep it uh, the external validity high, do everything we could to pursue that. We had fantastic leadership and, and that was needed, especially when there was the clash of cultures. But I think the other thing we learned was, you know, get broad input when you come across things like these unexpected issues. You know, don't tackle them on your own. Ask elsewhere. There are plenty of people now who have expertise in doing this. And that was cross industry as well. It was a tough ride because it was new and a first. Um, but, you know, if you're setting about this type of study, for, it's not going to be easy. I think two very good bits of wisdom for me were um, beware of the oh, you'll find. We were told a lot of people said, you know, you'll find this, you'll that, find that. And I, what I learned was ask the patients on participants what's acceptable. So uh, finally, it was the excellent collaboration that made it happen. Um, it wasn't a fairy story. We had difficulties along the way, but we did get through it. We've now extensively published and afterwards we'll say I will share the bibliography because many of these manuscripts actually relate to the issues we faced in the, in the study rather than the endpoints. And there's lots of those, as you can see. So thanks very much, John. Fantastic, Dave. Many, many, many thanks. Fascinating talk. Um, and again, um, there, are, there, there are questions coming in on the Q&A, and um, this is great to see. And please vote, upvote the, the, the questions that, so that we can get some sense of what, uh, what's the most uh, important to talk about at the end. Uh, we're on time, uh, minor miracle. Um, so we'll move swiftly on to our third speaker, Professor Nick Mills. Um, he's Chair of Cardiology and Data-Driven Innovation Lead um, for Health and Social Care in the University of Edinburgh. Um, and he's going to talk about, um, oh, well, he, he was going to talk about something, his, his slides just disappeared. Um, Data-enabled clinical trials, diagnosis and patient care. Um, Nick um, is the principal investigator of a multi-centered cluster randomized trial evaluating the impact of high sensitive troponin 1 assay on patients with suspected acute coronary syndrome, the, um, the nicely acronymed high stakes study. So away you go, Nick. Thank you very much, John. Uh, can you hear me okay? Um, I'm going to change the uh, direction slightly uh, with the discussion about data-enabled trials to move on to not pharmaceutical uh, drugs treatments, but uh, diagnosis itself. Um, I think one of the, the great opportunities with routine neglected data is to inform uh, on the diagnosis of disease. Much of what we know about most conditions has been gleaned from meticulous observation over decades uh, and centuries even. Uh, but with the digitalization of our electronic uh, record in the last 10 years, the, the volume of data that we have in which to inform the way we diagnose and classify as disease has grown exponentially. And, and you'll be forgiven for perhaps being slightly overwhelmed by healthcare data recently uh, during the coronavirus pandemic. But if we can harness this data effectively, then our knowledge of disease is going to increase in parallel and effective public health policies and better targeting of treatment can translate into better health. Now, um, you'll be delighted to know in the UK that we have a fabulous uh, diagnostics uh, industry. Um, uh, and much of what we understand really about the current pandemic is driven fundamentally by a, a single diagnostic test in terms of uh, how, how this condition spreads uh, throughout community. Uh, and if the UK government do indeed invest uh, substantially in mass population testing, uh, then the results of a diagnostic test are going to have an even more profound impact uh, on our way of life in 2021. Now, in my own specialty, uh, diagnostic testing has really fundamentally changed the way that we classify disease from one uh, based on symptoms 
patients with angina, stable or unstable angina, to one that recognizes the inherent value of defining underlying mechanisms, uh, the extent of the uh, disease process, and has been really uh, dramatically informed by the development of new biomarkers, imaging tests, and now wearable technologies over the last couple of years. The importance of diagnostic testing to everything we do in clinical practice cannot be overstated. Uh, although it's a relatively modest proportion of our healthcare spending, um, diagnostic tests inform the vast majority uh, of clinical decisions. In the UK, uh, prior to COVID-19, uh, I have no idea what the numbers are now, um, we, we did over uh, 950 million tests uh, last year, uh, and we spend roughly three billion pounds on, on testing. Now, the regulation of new medicines require, as we've heard, definitive evidence from efficacy and safety studies in randomized controlled trials. Whereas diagnostic just need to demonstrate technical performance or diagnostic performance, often in a group of patients that haven't actually uh, had their care managed by that test. Uh, and we know uh, often little about the impact of these tests on patient care or outcomes until after they receive market authorization. Furthermore, uh, diagnostics industry is really um, developing artificial intelligence methods uh, and the regulation of artificial intelligence in healthcare is really at its uh, infancy. So it's sort of in this context that we've been conducting what I call routine data enabled clinical trials uh, of new diagnostic tests for patients with heart disease. And um, we've done this through um, embedding screening and enrollment tools within the electronic patient record system, uh, and then through record linkage to a range of different uh, data sources in, our, in Scotland in order to characterize the population uh, and follow these uh, patients up. Uh, and we've done it without uh, any uh, direct patient contact in, in many of these uh, trials. Uh, we started uh, small uh, in just a thousand patients in a study evaluating a blood test developed by a, a diagnostics company, Abbott, Abbott Diagnostics. Um, and we did it just in, in a thousand consecutive patients. But by, by enrolling consecutive patients using this screening tool, uh, we were able to demonstrate for the first time that we've been systematically underdiagnosing heart attacks in women by using a common threshold for men and women. Um, if, if over the, the subsequent years, we have grown the uh, capability to do these studies, uh, we've now randomized in step wedge cluster randomized trials, uh, nearly 80,000 patients uh, and brought together routinely collected data from 10 hospitals in Scotland. Uh, we've learned really how to use this test effectively in practice, demonstrating that we can uh, make quicker decisions by ruling out heart attacks more effectively. Uh, we can increase the proportion of patients uh, from the emergency, who are discharged directly from the emergency department by over 50%. And crucially, by using routine data, we can follow patients up and demonstrate that the adoption of these pathways do not result in excess risk for patients. Similarly, uh, we've been uh, looking at new imaging technology and in our randomized trials here, we clearly demonstrate that the use of a CT scan to diagnose uh, the cause of uh, possible anginal symptoms is superior to, to other methods, it was unclear what impact the technology was having on treatment or on survival. And therefore, long after the trial was completed, we used routine data on prescribing and, and uh, hospitalization and death uh, to demonstrate that those who were managed with uh, imaging, those who we could see the disease, uh, had better uh, outcomes out to five years after the trial uh, had completed. Now, often new tests or biomarkers are introduced into clinical practice uh, as binary tests to rule in or rule out a condition. Uh, and the reality is what, when they're used in uh, routine clinical care in our complex patient population, where patients often have more than one condition, uh, they don't perform well uh, with a higher false negative rate uh, and certainly a high false positive rate. Acute heart failure is a, is a pretty good example of, of a condition where the diagnosis may be challenging. And therefore we've used a, a data enabled approach to combine 
the biomarker test along with routinely collected information about patients in order to develop a, 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 probability, a probability tool that informs on an individual's probability of the condition and gives estimated diagnostic uh, parameters, which is much more uh, tailored than just using a binary threshold. Uh, and of course, we can link this tool when it's introduced into clinical practice uh, with subsequent downstream testing uh, and to outcomes. Um, th there are um, a number of uh, investments that we've made over the last 10 years, and, and in particular recently, in the infrastructure that we have to do data enabled trials in, in diagnostics. Uh, much of that investment has come from the city region deal uh, and is being delivered in partnership with the University of Edinburgh and our uh, colleagues in the National Health Service, where data lock is bringing together not just the, the data from primary and secondary care, along with the uh, test results, um, but the methodological expertise from the trials unit, uh, and John and his team, uh, in order to design really smart uh, trials that are efficient, in order to understand the impact of the introduction of these tests into clinical practice. Uh, we can apply this infrastructure both to in vitro diagnostic tests through our partnership with NHS Bioresource, where samples can be identified through a tool embedded into clinical care uh, and excess material can be retained for further testing. Uh, but we can also do these uh, studies using AI algorithms and our imaging, uh, with our imaging colleagues where we have uh, access to PACS uh, imaging data. Um, you've heard a little bit uh, from Dave and Aziz about the strengths and limitations of using uh, routine data. I think for, for the diagnostics uh, field, uh, the big advantage is the, the ability to enroll unselected patients, which definitely improves the generalizability uh, of these trials. Uh, and also the, the way that by using screening tools embedded into clinical practice, we can actually evaluate the tests the way they're used by the usual care clinician, rather than in a subgroup of patients who are enrolled into uh, a research study, which often uh, leads to a, a very low risk patient population. Clearly, the, the main advantage is that they are less expensive. And now that the infrastructure is in place, uh, our cost per participant in our latest trial was around eight, eight uh, pounds per participant uh, for a 31,000 patient study, which compares to the quotes that I get from various diagnostic companies of around a uh, thousand pounds per participant for, for enrollment. Um, it, clearly that efficiency means that we can scale uh, these studies uh, and, and look at uh, meaningful events, not just the index diagnosis, but impacts on outcome. And the challenge, of course, is data quality, but um, we've developed various tools within DataLock to improve quality assurance and also provide an adjudication uh, facility that sits above the routine data, which helps us to ensure that we, for diagnostic studies, which is absolutely critical, that we're able to independently evaluate outcomes for these trials. I mean, the other challenge is governance and regulations, but uh, although this is a complex and evolving area, we've been doing it for around 10 years here in Lothian, and uh, I think have demonstrated that it's, it's feasible to do these sorts of trials. Anyway, uh, I look forward to the discussion later. If anyone has any questions that they don't want to post in the q and be happy to take those uh, directly, either through myself or through the data lock email, which is at the bottom of the slide. Thank you very much. Many, many thanks, Nick. Um, another excellent talk. Um, and the questions are coming in. So please, uh, please keep those uh, getting typed in on the Q&A function. And just to reiterate, we'll be, uh, we'll be selecting out uh, the, 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 the most popular questions um, and discussing them at the end. Okay, so now we're on to our fourth speaker, and this will come from um, Kay Boycott who's the Chief Executive of Asthma UK and the British Lung Foundation Partnership. And Kay is gonna be talking um, about the use of data to support clinical improvements for patients. And uh, Kay has a wealth of cross-sector experience in both executive and non-executive roles. And in her current post, uh, she has led digital transformation, cross-sector partnerships in research and innovation and in 2019, a merger with the British Lung Foundation. So, Kay, please, uh, please continue. Thanks, John, and uh, thanks to everyone who's listening. Um, I'm going to be unashamedly coming at this from a patient-centric um, um, point of view. Um, if we could do the next slide, please. Um, 
I'm going to talk um, why this is so important. I'm going to use um, people with asthma as the use case because I think uh, the 5.4 million people with asthma are pretty representative of the whole population and I think um, may give some clues for how patients may think from other conditions as well. I'm going to, for the first time, um, talk about my own personal experience of taking part in a clinical trial as a way of illustrating how important it is to be patient-centric and some of the opportunities there. And then um, I'm also going to uh, give a bit of a plug for some future opportunities and, and maybe for people to think differently, including advert for some funding coming up. John, I think you've still got your, um, uh, you're not on mute, so <laughs> thank you. Uh, next slide, please. So um, why have digital enabled and data enabled solutions been such a priority for Asthma UK? So digital transformation wasn't done in Asthma UK because it was a bit of a pet project. It was done because that's what people with asthma said they wanted and they needed. Um, around half of people with asthma don't take their medication as prescribed. Um, that's why the Salford Lung Study, you know, these are the reasons real, real world studies are really important um, to understand people. Three people a day die from an asthma attack in the UK, so these are pre uh, preventable. But, you know, however well you do a study, in the end, people are doing an awful lot of the self-care and the management of their condition at home, um, and particularly with an episodic condition like asthma that requires lots and lots of complex calculations every day. How much to take your medication when it's high pollen or it's uh, cold or there's high pollution? Um, and digital and data enabled tools to help people can really help uh, simplify that experience for them, as well as giving a wealth of data to be able to say what's going on for those people outside of a clinical um, environment. And I think it's really interesting, Dave, talking about the dampening down the pings that were coming through from a real world trial. I'm assuming that is only things that made it into the clinical system. Uh, we know that um, a significant minority of people who die from an asthma attack don't even touch the healthcare system. So there's huge amounts going on underneath um, for people that we still don't know anywhere near enough about. And different ways of collecting that data and understanding how people live their lives will give us um, new, new insights to be able to um, target treatments better and develop new treatments. Um, but also the other thing is that people with asthma, you know, you can start at zero and you can have it all your life. The highest risk groups, which we know from combining um, Experian data with lots and lots of um, health data is that the highest risk groups are digitally engaged. They are, they tend to be lower income, uh, they tend to be younger, but they are basically living their lives through mobile phones. And are those people going to be the people who will be recruited in as participants in clinical trials? Um, unlikely. Next slide, please. And, oh no, if you could back one. And, and that's really just to show, we still don't really know enough about the behavioral phenotypes of the people um, that we're, we're putting into trials. I mean, we're, we're still in the gender bias uh, piece here, but actually it, um, this is um, something that we're currently looking at and doing a piece of segmentation with Public Health England to see the different types of people depending on their access to healthcare, the medicines adherence, lifestyle behaviors, symptom monitoring and also have they had any behavior change support and the reason that's important is too often um, we read studies that say well this had a benefit but only for certain people and then we can't find who that is and it makes it very very hard to develop um, health economic cases um, for conditions that affect large amounts of people but where where people behave differently and that's really where having uh, richer data and more uh, digitally enabled trials could really help us unpick that so we can target the treatments um, at the people that need them. Next slide, please. And um, just for those of you who are worried that people don't want this, these are just some statistics. Um, about three years ago, we did a big uh, survey about data sharing and technology. Um, and also for um, participation in research and the vast majority of people are very, very comfortable with this. Um, and you can see all of this and, and this is um, correlated um, with other studies that we see on other conditions. Next slide, please. 
So this is my personal experience. And I think I, the reason I included this, I don't normally talk about personal experience because I normally talk about people with asthma and I don't have asthma. Um, but in 2013, I was, I had a, I had a condition that was affecting my life. And I saw a consultant and I was either offered a treatment where I had to commit to go into, uh, that is Queen Square, the um, neurology centre. And I either had to go in there once a week um, for 12 weeks to receive this treatment, or I could take part in a clinical trial that meant I could use a device um, and uh, self-administer it at home. Um, that seemed like a bargain to me as a single mother with two small children and quite a busy job and interviewing for Asthma UK at the time. Um, so I went for that because I couldn't commit once a week because uh, I also went on holidays and things like that. Um, I did the trial. I ended up being randomised to the daily dose of the uh, treatment. Um, I remember dragging the device to Cambodia and Vietnam um, while I did it. But I did do it and I completed my paper diary. And... It was fabulous. The outcome was absolutely fabulous. The uh, the thing, um, the symptoms I had had completely gone away and I was a very, very happy person. And I literally just one day dumped all the old devices in the um, into the reception, left uh, with my paper, dumping my paper things and, uh, and went away. Um, and I used to wonder what had happened. And then the symptoms came back about five years later. And I searched and searched and searched and found finally on PubMed, because I knew what it was by then, what had happened. And it, guess what, had shown uh, benefits in some people and not in others. So the whole thing had stalled. Uh, this was, as I say, transformational for me. Um, the follow up I had then had to do was commit to 12 weeks of going into a hospital every week to have the treatment again. Um, what I think is different if we look at this differently and what needs to be done differently first of all i was recruited and i do wonder whether i was recruited because i was seen as the sort of person that would complete the trial and i do think we need to think much more about inclusion and how we uh, use the data that we know about people even your postcode can give you a lot to make sure that we are recruiting a broad and diverse range of people to trials we also need to really think through the convenience um, you know, whilst I had a busy life, I could actually make the time and have the sorts of jobs that would allow me to go in four times, which I had to do for the clinical trial during the middle of the day without getting sacked. Um, but we need to really think about that. And that's why anything that can be done as remote trials are so important. The other thing was um, just digitizing the whole experience would have made it much easier for me. But the other reason I think we need to really think through the data piece is I wasn't thanked for the trial. I didn't know about the outcome. I would have done follow up trials, but nobody ever came back to me. And really importantly was how long did this intervention last for? And we didn't know. And if all of that had been digitized, it could have been so much better. And I presume that's what, what has happened is we've lost three or four or five years of knowledge and learning that would have been relatively cheap and easy to pick up had it been designed in a different way. Next slide, please. Um, and this is born out next. Sorry, if you click forward, this has been born by some of the early work we've done in this area. Um, we've had this um, through something called the Asthma Lab, around 150 different innovators through now. And one of the things that's the common theme is that people are still coming with treatments and still coming with trial ideas that are not yet focused enough on user needs. Um, they're not frictionless. Um, we, we, we hear of things like collecting data and then asking people to print of PDFs and post them to the researcher. Well, how many people are going to have printers even? And why can't that be emailed? And to be honest, why can't that be naturally sent through as an API? Uh, we also see way too much focus on secondary rather than primary care, even though 85% of people with asthma are treated in primary care and a real lack of integration about what it takes. And we heard about the, the fantastic Salford Lung Study, but also about the effort it took to integrate all of this. And still we're seeing um, just people not understanding how to bring all of this data together. Next slide, please. Um, but there is, uh, there are other ways. Um, a, a colleague of mine was insisting that I put this into the, um, into my talk. And, and this is because if you start with the user at the heart, you can start with solutions that could help both um, 
that can help uh, patients, that can help researchers and can help the healthcare team. And this is something called Brian. It's an online app developed by the Brain Tumor Society to record your entire brain tumor experience. Um, I, I won't talk about it. The fabulous Sarah Linzel um, um, is um, the expert in this, but this, this really has started from designing interventions that are then going to get researched from a user perspective. And um, just to say there is, um, uh, this is one of my two ads, uh, the potential to rest, uh, replicate this is a current focus of a collaboration initiative. And um, we'd be delighted to hear from anyone who'd be interested. Next slide, please. And um, another thing I just want to do a plug for is um, there's a question about funding. Um, ASM UK and the British Lung Foundation, NIHR and um, EPSRC are launching a three million plus fund over the next six weeks um, around healthcare technology that absolutely wants to see this user centred design bringing together technology companies, researchers, partnerships and patients um, to really help um, get these sorts of trials up and running. But we will be looking um, for the patient experience to be at the heart of this, um, because we believe that's the only way you're going to transform asthma outcomes, particularly for those at high risk. Next slide, please. So summary, there are lots of unmet needs that could be helped by data driven innovation, particularly really understanding the different patients who are there. It's very, very hard to identify target populations to get to successful health economics when you think about this as behavioral rather than just clinical, but that's absolutely critical for adoption. Um, people are relaxed about this and they want to help. Um, as I hope you've shown in my experience, the blurring between what's a service and what's a research is, is it's much more blurred in participants' minds and they therefore they, you know, they've got a vested interest and really want to help. But it needs to be much more designed around the needs of the user and frictionless if possible. And again, there's three million pounds to support anybody who wants to innovate in this space. Thank you, John. Many, many thanks, Kay. Um, okay, so um, uh, the questions are still coming in, which is great to see. Um, and uh, without further ado, we'll move to our fifth and penultimate speaker, James Brook. Um, and James is going to talk about um, virtual trials, the perspective of industry. James is the head of UK and Ireland clinical at IQVIA. Um, his career covers 25 years in the pharmaceutical industry from clinical research associate and progressing through positions in Wyeth, Novartis and GSK. Uh, James's guiding principle is that a patient's right to participate in the latest, res latest research studies as part of their routine care. So James. <laughs> Uh, thank you, John. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with IQVIA, um, we're a human data science company, uh, basically a, a very large CRO with over 60,000 people employed globally. In the UK, we deliver around 20% of the commercial research studies. So my team are delivering between 250 studies per year uh, in the UK alone in the phase two to phase three setting. Um, what I was going to talk about today was, was the vision for the future of virtual trials. However, with COVID-19, that future is increasing in the present. Uh, first slide, please. So what we saw with COVID-19, it's acted as a catalyst for UK clinical trial research transformation. Um, along with Southampton University, led by Professor Tom Wilkinson and AstraZeneca, IQVIA were asked to set up uh, the Accord program. This program was to repurpose uh, drugs uh, into pre-ventilated COVID-19 positive patients, so hospitalised patients, but to do that at pace. And what we found was basically the exemplary leadership and collaboration between the NIHR, the MHRA, HRA, but particularly the hospitals and the patients um, was transformative in our delivery. That one focus approach meant we delivered a compound into active research center in a matter of days, something that traditionally would have taken 18 months. The first study we set up from receiving compounds to being able to recruit patients in 34 days, um, record breaking. 
that has meant we've had global recognition for the UK research environment, not just looking at our quality um, and our long-standing reputation of a slow startup and failure to deliver, but this moved us to actually setting studies up quicker than the USA in the COVID-19 setting, um, which means that we showcased our end-to-end -end solutions from precision medicine to real-world uh, studies. But it's also to do this in a COVID uh, environment, we've had to introduce significant virtual study capabilities uh, from e-consent uh, to source data verification and source monitoring remotely, um, to even Zoom ethics, um, which, which is, again, it's transformative. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one back. So what of the virtual trials of the future? Um, I think you've heard from everybody about how this needs to be focused completely around the patient. Um, we need to shift our visits into a shared care model. So they're not going to the secondary care center. They're not going to the hospital. Uh, on average, uh, driving an hour and a half, parking, walking through that hospital with the increased risk of infection at the moment. Um, to have a routine blood test, have a routine ECG or to be asked a questionnaire. Why can't that be shared with primary care. Why can't we take that a step further and even place that in the patient's home or the place of, pa patient's place of work? We just heard Kay talking about her ability to go into a research study. Not many of us can do that with the pressures of our work and the demands of our work. And that means we've got a very pre-selected patient population. We need to normalize research, but to enable normalized research, we need to data enable the teams delivering it. Imagine electronic feasibility and site identification. We've got fantastic patient databases in the UK. We can identify where those patients are. We have a register of research activity so we can see who's doing what and who's interested in, in what. Um, why do we send out thousands of questionnaires through to um, already pressurized investigators to say that they've got a minus 80 degree freezer or they've got a centrifuge when we collected that data so many times previously. Um, moving through to screening electronically, moving through to virtual consultation. Uh, previously, over 80% of primary care activity was face-to-face -face where a patient went to the, um, to the health center. Now that's completely flipped the other way and over 80% is now on, on a virtual model. We can do this with patient concierges to improve the patient experience in research studies. And then ultimately moving electronic, electronic medical records into ECRF, reducing data transcription errors, um, reducing the data queries produced because of those and making it as simple as possible and therefore freeing up so much more of the research uh, clinician's time. Patient data capture. Let me give you an example of a, a rheumatoid arthritis patient on a, on a pain study. Um, traditionally, measurements of pain are between scale of one to 10. You can now measure pain by listening to a patient's voice. The patient's sitting there. Um, Alexia in the kitchen is listening to them talking, hearing their increase in pain. They get up, go to the kitchen cabinet to take their medication. As they take their research medication, they take the med cap off. That records the time they're taking that drug. They're then prompted by an announcement on their iPad so they pick it up to interact. And as they're interacting, it's measuring their blood pressure, it's measuring their tremor. And through the camera, it's looking at their pupil dilation and concentration levels with, within uh, the interactions of their eyes as they're reading the questions. Um, they're wearing an, an eye watch, which is they're measuring their cardiac activity. All of this is normalized within their daily activities. So the data is so much more accurate. And then we'll be moving on to truly big data, where we stream in their Stra Strava, their iFit, their Fitbit data, where we look at the genetics. And as we've already had, heard from Kay with the asthma, their environmental situation. But then we add in loyalty cards. So when you state you're only drinking 11 units of alcohol a week, but you're buying a crater Chablis uh, once a week, and the two don't quite add up, we can question that. 52% of statins do not work. 
We're prescribing them, patients are suffering the side effects, but they have no patient benefit. All of those drugs have been licensed through our traditional research methodology. We need to change that. Next slide, please. So this was preparing for tomorrow, but it's actually preparing for today. Um, we need to carry forward a lot of what we've learned from the COVID-19 response, um, but it is focused on day-to-day -to, -day to data. We've got some of the best uh, research data, we've got some of the best patient data in the world in the UK. We've made some great starts with HDR, uh, with NHSX, um, NHS Digital, um, a great start, but we have no nationalized research policy for de-identified patient data. We need to map site capability, their IT, their EMR capability, along with their research activity. So we can very simply do feasibility. We can very simply uh, identify those sites that can do EMR into ECRF. And we need to do a, a centralized patient mapping. Every patient offered a study, uh, not just medicinal, but devices, apps, interventions, physio. The research environment needs to change. We need to normalize research so all staff are trained on ICH GCP. Um, we need to make it part of a clinician's normal day job and that we don't have you know, a research clinic tagged on to the end of their 60 hours a week. Um, that won't be for all studies. You will still need some specialized teams, but more and more of what we can be what we can achieve could be spread across primary, secondary, and social care. We need to democratize research so more people can participate and our results are better. And critically, we need to make it faster. Um, if we can do responses to COVID in basically days, um, we need to carry that forward, have professional ethics committees, not voluntary, um, that sit full time, um, simplify the local doc reviews, most importantly, we need to engage the patients, educate, engage, and empower. We need to make the first question a patient asks when they go in to see a clinician is, is what's my research option, not what's my treatment option, and give them genuine choice, but ultimately give them genuine results. We fail to transmit the results of most of the studies in the UK through to our patients who've given up their time to participate, and that is fundamentally wrong. Virtual trials are the future. I see this very much as risk-based monitoring was 10 years ago, where it was new. Uh, it's now becoming more normalized and it won't be for every study. Uh, if you've got a phase one study, you've got an intensive oncology study, you may have just tiny elements of, of virtual trials, but more and more will be done in the patient's home and the patient's place of work at their convenience. We need to make it the patient's right to research. Uh, not an option when a clinician's got the time to discuss it with them. We have to embrace and engage virtual trials and enrich our nation's health because of that. And the UK is in a unique position to do this, but we have to seize, seize the moment now. Uh, thank you, John. Fantastic. Many, many thanks, James. Um, so that, that's uh, generated uh, quite a few new questions uh, around um, data governance and uh, ethics of uh, data capture and storage. Um, so perhaps we, may, we might get time to, to discuss uh, those questions briefly at the end. Um, and that brings us to our last uh, speaker, Matt Sides, from, <laughs> Professor Matt Sides from the um, MRC Clinical Trials Unit at UCL, and Matt is going to talk about moving forward data-enabled trials in the UK. Matt um, describes himself as commonly advising on trial design and conduct of external trials. He has a particular interest in the use of routine collected electronic health records, adapted and adaptive and efficient designs for load-phase trials, and clinical trial data sharing. So, Matt, please, uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, John. Thank you for having me here this morning. So yeah, I, I hope I'm going to form some brackets here with the first uh, presentation we have from Aziz this morning. I'd say you've used the term digitally enabled. I recently heard the term data enabled being used by CPRD, and please forgive the typo on here. At the workshop they did with HDR UK and NIHR about 18 months or so ago, they described data enabled trials as ones that were efficient 
through these definitions that all of these aspects had to be embedded in routine care, the design, particularly the feasibility and using that data to draw out that recruitment would be facilitated by electronic health records to identify potential participants and, and really now with a view to taking trials to where the patients are and looking at parity, equality, inclusivity and that, that the assessments and the benefits of harms will be directly captured in the way that we've been hearing about this morning and that the analyses and the interpretation would be using standard electronic health variables. But we need to make sure that what's captured in the system really reflects the outcome measures we want to use. So I don't think every trial is gonna be able to be data enabled by drawing all of these aspects in, uh, here, but the digitally enabled approach you've talked about today feels like a broader definition to me. Regardless, there's plenty of lessons that we should all be learning from this. Next slide, please. So, First question, of course, is are trials at the moment accessing electronic health records, given that we think it's got the power to transform at least late phase clinical trials? So we ran a systematic review. Sarah Lenson here was the first author, and we found 81 registries in the UK that were holding electronic health records in some form. So we have 13 of those have publicly accessible records, which is great. We we're able to look at those and we reached out to the rest. The majority got back to us and the majority of those weren't sharing data. But overall, between 2013 and 2018, we found 160 trials in the UK that had successfully accessed electronic health records for research. Now, I listen to more or less on Radio 4 every week, so I hear Tim Harford's voice in my head going, is this a big number? Well, actually, it's not. You know, if we look at how many trials went past ethics committees in the UK in 2015, that was about just between 900 and 1,000. So the number of trials accessing electronic health records over that five year period was probably the equivalent to about 3% of all trials in the UK. That's a pretty small number. Now, about two thirds of the successful applications had gone to NHS Digital, about a fifth to a quarter have passed ISD Scotland, and about one in 11 had gone to Public Health England. And mostly there were large cancer or cardiovascular studies. And people were doing this for all sorts of reasons. Uh, you know, it wasn't all about outcome measures, some was about methodology research. And as applicants, we should also bear in mind that trials are a very small proportion of the data release requests that go in. So we found that of all the requests we looked at, only 2% were actually trials. So when we're submitting our applications, we are not the core business for the people that are providing that information. Next slide, please. So there's a number of challenges that the UK can address. Let's contrast that less than 5% of trials actually accessing data at the time to Graham Powell's review that came out earlier this year. He looked at NIHR protocols that were funded in the last couple of years and found that half of them planned to access routinely collected data. So there's a disconnect, isn't there, between how many trials want to and how many trials have been getting that information. So we need those clear processes, we need good route maps that aren't there at the moment. We need to be able to retain the data that we access according to the regulations, which isn't always the case. NHS Digital has the ability at the moment to say that we have to get rid of the data, destroy the data. Well, that contrasts with the, uh, with the data share, with the, the clinical trials regulations. So if we destroy the data, we're breaking the law, right? So that's a problem for us. Or we have to be sure that we go back to the hospital and check the data, and, and that's duplication of effort. We don't want that either. So working to, to resolve that. And then there's the issue of data sharing. I know we're talking about trials today, but that's secondary use. When are the data trial data enough that we're allowed to share them? And then the issue of source data. It's been touched upon a couple of times. It's important for the regulations. We now know from the MHRA that they see data taken directly from the hospital system as source data. But if we're using a collated central administrative system, you know, like the hospital episode statistics database, you know, is, does that count as source data or has it been processing along the way that stops it being sourced? Well, work's required for that. We're about to start doing that work with NHS Digital. And then we need to understand the utility of the data. Where can routinely collected data replace trial-specific data collection? And where can it not, or, or not yet? Next slide, please. So those data utility questions are a place for SWOT, so studies within a trial. Here's some data from a trial that we've recently submitted for review. This is under review. This is a Barrett's esophagus screening trial run in Oxford. They worked with us to do this work, which is great. In the left-hand graph, the blue are deaths that were reported on trial-specific data collection, trial teams reaching out to the, uh, to the, to the, the central trial team. The green bars are the data that were being collected 
from NHS Digital. They were getting a download about once a year. So you can see at any point in time, there were more deaths known about from NHS Digital than there were through trial specific collection. But actually that gray dot means that if you add them together and then you know, deduplicate the deaths, there were more deaths known overall. A different way of showing that is in the right hand panel. So the yellow dots, either the size of each dot, relates to uh, the number of deaths. Along the bottom of the year of reporting by NHS Digital, up the upper y-axis is the number of deaths known on trial specific reporting. And the yellow dots are the ones where they agreed. The green dots are the deaths that were known or reported first out of NHS Digital, and the blue dots reported first through trial specific collection. And the gray ones are the ones that at the time of reporting were still only known by one of those sources. So you'd think fact of death should be really straightforward, but actually even there, you know, there's, there's clearly issues to address. Next slide, please. So we need more of these, these SWOTs. We know there are some in the literature, but there's plenty of scope for more. We've written up our protocol from that death comparison, and we're writing up some more so that we can do and, and collate this information. So there's a generic SWOT in a SWOT SWOT repository uh, held in Belfast. And we've now got an ongoing systematic review for published and importantly unpublished comparisons. So do you have the potential to do a comparison? Do you have some data that's being collected through, through two sources that you could compare and add to the literature? Or do you have an unpublished comparison, perhaps one that you reported at a conference you've never managed to turn into a paper? Could you publish it or could you share that unpublished comparison with us? Saim Ahmed here is running this as part of his PhD and we'd love to hear from you. No SWOT, no one instance is gonna say it's okay to use or it's not yet able to use this data. But if we stitch this data together into a kind of patchwork blanket of information, then together we'll be able to work out the appropriate places going forward. Next slide, please. So there are some challenges going forward. Ooh, everything's moved around on the page. The new NIHR MRC Trials Methodology Research Partnership has started up. There's a health informatics for trials working group, which I'm co-leading with Amanda Farin in Leeds. And that has a number of working groups. Uh, it's based on the, this is based on the sort of the clinical studies group model from NIHR. There's new groups, uh, we'll refresh the membership periodically, but we're always welcoming people to be affiliate members. Health Data Research UK is also very new. Martin Landry from Oxford is leading the national trials theme and his work packages around clinical trials in the Breathe Hub, in Data Can, looking at cancer, and of course, DigiTrials, which is really trying to focus on clinical trials. And a picture here of this work between NHS Digital and DigiTrials with Tom Denwood and Heather Pinches leading this information. And of course, CPRD is looking to do more data-enabled trials. The NIHR Stats Group has a particularly interest in routine data, not just for trials, but more broadly. And NIHR has just announced this summer the first tranche of studies that it's uh, funding through its data enabled trials call. I think it's six, it might be nine trials that have been funded, but we'll hear more about those in due course. So let me just, next slide please. As I just mull over the, the, the couple of issues that remain for us. There's plenty of skeptics out there that I meet on a regular basis. They say, we can never get the data, the data out of date, the data are unusable, why are you doing this? And plenty of true believers who say, why are you still doing trial specific data collection? Clearly we should all be doing this already. The truth is somewhere in between. Where it is in between probably varies from study to study, from area to area at this moment. And that's why it's such a right area for us to be doing research and get this right for the future. So more trials should be digitally enabled, but probably not all, as you've been hearing. Electronic health record for recruitment, well, that's probably going to be good for prevalent cases where the patients, where the potential participants are out in the wild, where they're seeing GPs, but they're not having conversations about recruitment. I primarily work on incident case kind of trials where we're looking at recruiting patients who are newly diagnosed with cancer or had their cancer come back. Well, they come to the clinic, they kind of identify themselves by coming to you. So probably the electronic health records don't help so much for recruitment there, but it doesn't mean it's not important overall. All trials can probably benefit from efficacy data, but safety data probably is more difficult, at least when it comes to SUSARs and the fast collection of you know, what's serious, what's related, what's unexpected. And then I wonder how we should be documenting the risks associated in our risk assessments, the risks associated with accessing and using and using the source data and retaining electronic health records for trials. I think the presentation we heard from uh, IQVIA was really interesting and running so many of the UK trials. I wonder how much UK industry really wants to relinquish the ability to carefully control data collection. I'd understand if they're cautious in that. 
And of course, in international trials where you've only got a couple of UK trials and you're running across multiple healthcare systems, are people really going to want to connect in across multiple systems? So those are my thoughts. I say, next slide. Thank you very much for having me this morning. Really appreciate the ability to, uh, to talk to you. Fantastic, many thanks and sincere thanks to all six speakers, all excellent talks and uh, everybody managed to keep to time, which has made my job uh, a lot easier. We're now moving into the um, discussion section. The questions have been coming in thick and fast and some have been answered in the Q&A. Um, I mean, broadly speaking, there's, there's, a, there's a range of questions, but I, I, my job is to try and select out just in the few minutes that remain some sort of themes to, to discuss. Um, and broadly speaking, there were, there were um, technical que questions about uh, the role of artificial intelligence and mobile smart diagnostics. And I think I might try and get Nick to, to answer that in a minute. Uh, there were also a, a raft of questions around uh, resource issues. What, what does, you know, what do data, data or digital enabled trials mean to the costing, uh, costing models that we use? Uh, there were also questions that maybe Dave could pick up on, on that. Uh, it sounds like the Salford lung study was fairly resource intensive and there's, there's interest in uh, can you achieve the excellence of the Salford Lung Study, but do it more on budgets aligned with you know what public funders are prepared to um, to pay. And then there was um, lots and lots of questions about the thorny issue of data security and governance, uh, particularly about around vulnerable participants from Autism Research Centre. That was a question that came in the ethics of data capture and storage. So I think, think maybe we'll start with that one, but rather than go into the whole issue of data security and governance, because we could be here until the cows come home and probably beyond, what could, could I ask um, maybe Aziz uh, um, to, to respond to that one? What, what, what has changed in the light of COVID um, in, in terms of uh, our, our approach or our willingness or our risk, you know, risk appetite in terms of data security and governance? Has, has the, uh, the need to get answers to difficult questions very quickly changed the balance at all, do you think? Or has it, has it made a, a difficult situation even worse? Uh, um. Yeah, so John, I think it's a, it's a bit of a mixed picture. I mean, I think for some of the COVID, directly COVID-related work and trials, um, particularly with, uh, for example, the recovery uh, platform trial, I mean, I think there's been absolutely phenomenal progress. Um, I mean, I think what's helped there is, um, and the COPE notices that have been served in England, the fact that, I mean, colleagues have come together across the UK um, so, I mean, I think in some contexts, things have, have definitely improved um, uh, and there has been an acceleration. And I think uh, um, and James was making this point around, I mean, how, um, I mean, we're basically seeing new models of delivering care. Um, so there's greater acceptance of these digitally enabled approaches, not only to clinical trials, but also delivery of care. I think other issues still remain. So this challenge of getting data, uh, I mean, unless you've got direct access to data sets, still remains problematic. I mean, I know Health Data Research U UK and its various hubs are working hard on this issue. Um, things are progressing, but uh, it still remains uh, pretty challenging in that respect. I think maybe the last point to make is that overall, I mean, getting this balance right around uh, um, access to data, trustworthy use of data, um, keeping the public informed and uh, um, gaining appropriate permissions is, is a delicate one. And I think in, in, in certain contexts, such as when we're dealing with a public health emergency, such as COVID, then then it's kind of reasonable for the balance to shift. But, it, but I think more generally speaking, this is still a bit of a work in progress in the UK. Many, many thanks, Aziz. Um, I, I think that, that sounds very, uh, very plausible um, that there will be that balance that needs to be struck. And then we have to learn, learn, you know, what we can safely do and what we possibly have to sort of redouble our efforts, our efforts on. So th thank you for that. Just, just then let's deal with the technical question. So over to you, Nick, there was a question about uh, does, what's the role of AI in digitally enabled trials? I mean, I think you had mentioned that AI was taking a, 
a big role in, in general in diagnostic type trials. And there was also an even more specific question about what's the role of mobile smart diagnostics, which I confess I'm not even sure what that is. So, uh, so over, over to you, Nick. I think both uh, interesting, quite different questions. I think the, the, the role of AI in, in trials, I think there were already a few responses in the text there, but probably in terms of trial methodology and how you do trials, uh, definitely in terms of becoming more efficient at screening data to identify potential participants, uh, I'm sure there are really good applications for AI there. I guess I'm more interested in, in how AI is introduced into the healthcare system and how we can evaluate it. Uh, and I think uh, that is a, going to be a, a major challenge. We don't really know how to regulate these algorithms and tools. Um, but uh, evaluating it, it, you know, we are going to need to try and use routine data, uh, I think, to do that, because there aren't going to be huge funded pots of R&D money to evaluate these technologies in the same way there are for pharmaceutical trials. So I think there is a big opportunity here for these data-enabled trials to inform the use of these technologies in, in a smart way. More specifically about uh, smart diagnostics for COVID-19, uh, every single uh, in vitro diagnostics company that I've ever worked with is now really working on the development of antibody tests and antigen tests. Um, I think it was uh, James who mentioned that we need to think completely differently about our models of care in the future, and it's got to be much more accessible and easier for patients. And the idea that we all have to drive to airports 200 miles away to get a nasal swab done is, is absurd. And I'm sure in 2021, we will have these platforms available to allow um, uh, convenient testing for, 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 for people. Um, there are 150 different companies working on it right now, um, and of course, within the UK, our infrastructure is somewhat uh, centralised where we have all of these core diagnostic laboratory facilities uh, in our hospitals, which don't really lend, doesn't really lend itself to uh, convenient testing for people. So I think the companies that are going to be successful in this space are going to be those that understand the importance of connectivity uh, between handheld devices uh, and uh, electronic health, health records. And there are a couple of really interesting companies out there that have um, products that, that will for sure become widely appeared. Fantastic, very, very clear, Nick. Uh, there's just actually one for UK. Um, there's uh, several people have asked um, broadly about um, the kind of use metrics for user experience or, um, you know, um, in, in, this, in these digitally able trials, how, how, do you, how do you actually measure success in, in patient engagement? You know, what, what is a successful engagement? What, what, on the other hand, is a missed opportunity? Have you, any, any thoughts on that just quickly? Yeah, um, and I have, I have posted some stuff in the chat, actually. I mean, I think the first thing is, um, who are you going out to try and engage? So actually, what's your reach um, if you want to be as inclusive as possible? Quite often we start counting from the people who have said they will participate as opposed to the ones who didn't want to participate. And that's really important. Um, then um, I've put a sort of try to answer. It depends what the study's trying to achieve and what the journey you're trying to take people on. And so we use pretty sim simple stuff about um, duration of engagement, drop off. Um, net promoter scores. Um, we will take a lot of those metrics more from commercial and digital marketing uh, metrics rather than conventional um, uh, clinical. Um, and I think that's one of the things I would advise people to, to look outside the health sector because um, we're looking at um, a group of people who act more like consumers than patients. We don't like the word patients, to be honest. Okay, many thanks. And, uh, and then just, just I think we've got couple of minutes left so just time to kind of squeeze in this last one about uh, resource models um you know uh, there's been a couple of questions uh, some numbers that the salford lung study had a, a staff of 140 um so how how can you do this type of exercise you know with the excellent results and, and definitive outputs that come with how could you possibly try and do that at, at, uh, at lower resource and then there was another more subtle question which is actually um the 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 it's possible that uh, digitally enabled trials will just change the cost base so that more of the cost will come to uh, be, be research costs rather than infrastructure costs. And that, that you know, is that going to make these, um, these, these, um, these studies unattractive, particularly to the charitable section? 
So uh, may, maybe could I ask Dave to come back on the Salford Lung Study and <clears throat> and then maybe ask um, ask James to just just try and give some insight into the funding models for these these studies. Yeah, I mean, Dave. The, I mean, the, it's a it's a it's a really good question, and there's no doubt about it. We we did over engineer the Salford Lung Study, and and we did that because of so many people saying, well, what you'll find is you know the regulators won't approve it unless you do this. The GPs won't do it unless you do that. There was lots of you will finds, which many of which turned out to be untrue. I mean, one of the greatest experiences was when we went for joint advice from NICE and the MHRA, and they approved um, the concept and approved the protocol first time round after everyone telling us they would never approve it. You know, so so I think there's a lot of wisdom that's being uh, accumulated now. And in fact, when James described his vision of the future, when, when it's just part of what we do and it's part, you know, that's the destination, isn't it? Which would just be a game changer. And it would be absolutely inspiring for us all to be sort of part of that. So, but, and it is going in that direction. So I think, I think that is where we're going to end up. Um, and if we, we, if we were to uh, run a sulfur like study now, an interventional study like that, it would probably be about half the cost now, actually. We sort of did, est did some estimates. So it's a changing landscape. And we were first and, out there and we over-engineered things. And also generally, you know, innovation costs. And, and the yeah. first time you do something, you know, it might be totally unrepresentative of the cost, whereas the hundredth time you do it, if, you, if you're doing it sensibly, it should be a lot more affordable. Yeah. Okay. Oh, fantastic. And then um, James, and uh, I'm sorry to put you under time pressure, but any any thoughts about the uh, cost? I, I, I think Dave summarised it. That the more we normalise research, the more it, it's not dissipating the cost of other services. We are actually just collecting data electronically. That's not somebody sitting there taking a questionnaire, which is actually the expensive part. You're collecting the data through the iPads. You're collecting data through digital devices. So you're your sources of data expand exponentially. The detail that can provide us is significantly greater than a one-time stop check time point. But the way we're doing it becomes so much more simpler that it should reduce costs over time, but it will be over time. If you look at risk-based monitoring, it has had a somewhat decrease in the overall cost of studies, but the improvement in quality has been drastic. So I think it's, it's that, going to be that balance on the richness of the data sources we get, which means drugs will be uh, more effective when they're licensed across a broader population against the fact we are introducing significant new technology here and we're going to have significant challenges to get that to work, which will have a cost implication. Fantastic. Uh, very, very, very well put. Um, OK, well, look, guys, uh, I found this hugely informative and uh, I think there's been a great success. So many, many thanks to all our speakers, but particularly thanks to all of the people that uh, attended. Uh, there will be an opportunity for people that, to tell your colleagues because this will be available um, uh, streamed on YouTube. Uh, and that, I'll now just uh, hand over to Andrea Taylor, who will just finish off the proceedings. Hello everybody, um, my name is Andrea Taylor. I'm Head of Business Development at Edinburgh Innovations and I'm just stepping in at the end of this excellent morning of talks, really just in terms of helping with that follow on and, and next steps and co co um, connection. So just in brief, um, I work for Edinburgh Innovations, which is the commercial arm of the university. And we work both with our researchers, many of those who you've heard speak today um, to help them realize the impact of research and also connecting with industry um, to allow them to connect with the excellent research base and expertise we have here. We have a very broad remit. Um, unlike many other commercial arms, we don't just look after the university IP, um, but we, we work through um, the whole commercial and, and translational journey of research, whether it's helping our, our academics with consultancies, collaborations, running and supporting events like um, these today and um, commercialising our research. And obviously, as we've heard today, innovating in, in, in this space, harnessing data to drive better healthcare happens in collaboration. And these sort of events where we can learn from industry and, and other um, innovating um, colleagues um, and also collaborate is, is sort of what we're about. And so in terms of 
connecting we we want to follow up we want to um, encourage you to um, continue the conversation with us and so I just want to make two introductions um, so Phil Ellis in our team will be particularly following up with our external guests been really pleased today to have so many um, existing collaborators new industry participants new sort of universities joining us and so in order to help you continue those discussions, whether it's connecting with our expertise, understanding any opportunities, how we can help you, how our perhaps funding streams um, can help collaboration, we'll be doing some follow up, but encourage you to also reach, reach out to Phil. And then next slide, obviously we work really closely with our staff. We have a team embedded in all of our institutes. So connecting with the research that's going on is um, relatively straightforward. And for all of our internal colleagues, um, the Keirs speak to us early, we can help um, accessing funding, facilitating that work with industry um, and helping with you truly thinking about translating the research. But I think, as John said, it's been a really great morning of talks. Um, it's really great to see the perspectives, not just from industry, but also from academia and the perspective from the patients and, and, and NHS. And so hopefully this is a, um, a session that's left uh, participants and guests wanting more and that we'll be able to follow up with some exciting um, conversations to explore further opportunities in which we can continue to innovate and look at how we um, harness data and digitize trials in this important space. So thanks everyone and thanks um, John